Welcome to the Business of Hearing podcast, the podcast for high-performing hearing care clinics that want to learn the strategies, ideas, and truths behind some of the smartest private practice clinics in the world. Now, time for your hosts, Phil M. Jones and Ollie Luke. Uh-huh. How is the city right now? It's got snow. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad I came down to Florida this time. Well, we can't see it this time. I see a beautiful picture. And I know that you're going to look remarkably similar to that image. Oh, yeah. Maybe. I didn't know if you wanted me to come on. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> look at that. Same sunglasses on head with headphones. That's right. How are Longer you? hair, though. COVID hair. <laughs> Nobody would have noticed unless you said. <laughs> yeah, I know. The city's got lots of snow. It's really been fun uh, the last couple of weeks. I, I think this is the most it snowed in the five and a half years I've lived here. So every time it snows, you get to mask up and go chomp around. Uh, in the uh, in the new snow. It's really hey, fun. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. Well, everybody who's here live, I'm guessing, already knows who you are. That's why they showed up for this. But for anybody listening to this in the recording, is thinking, who on earth is Kate O'Neill? What is this tech humanist thing? I'm going to read your bio from the back of the book right now. In this moment, you're going to blush. And Kate O'Neill, um, the tech humanist, is helping humanity prepare for us. Uh, for an increasingly tech-driven future by teaching businesses how to be successful with human-centric data and technology strategies. Her strategic advisory firm, KO Insights, is committed to making human experience more meaningful at scale. As the author, speaker, and advisor to Fortune 500s, Kate draws upon more than 20 years of leading innovations across technology, marketing, and operations in companies from startups to Fortune 500. Among her prior achievements, She created the first content management role at Netflix, developed Toshiba America's first intranet, led cutting edge experience optimization work at magazines.com, was the founder and CEO of MetaMarketer and a first of its kind analytics and and digital strategy agency. It's not bad, right? This is like an old bio as well, which I'm going to embarrass you with. But Kate is an author of several previous books, including Pixels in Place. She's a favorite keynote speaker for executive audiences from global companies such as Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Cisco, Kelly Services, and many others, as well as for leaders from industries as diverse as healthcare, nonprofits, public radio, education, and beyond. She was featured by Google in the launch of their global campaign for women in entrepreneurship. Her insights have been featured in CNN, uh, CNN Money, Time, Forbes, USA Today, the BBC, and other national and international media. And now in Orange and Grey Book Club, right? Which is without question the the, the icing on the cake from all of those other (laughs) cool publications. But you are quite an impressive person. We've had the privilege of chatting on numerous, numerous occasions. And I'm excited now to share you with more of the world and even more of the world of hearing care. So, Kate, first question for you today is, how does one become a tech humanist? Well, I think there's three concepts that I really wanted to draw out in tech humanist and the work, the work of writing the book, as well as the work of kind of creating the movement overall, which I believe that this is. Um, And those three concepts are that the advancement of technology is largely driven by business, that business creates most human experiences and that humans thrive on meaning and meaningful experiences. And that if you put those three pieces together, that you get a sort of three-way syllogism almost, where, where you sort of understand this, this relationship that business and technology and humans need to have in, in, with each other. And I, that I feel like business really has the driving opportunity here to create a, a better world for humans to create better experiences for humans that are also more meaningful for the businesses and more profitable for the businesses so that's the exciting opportunity here Uh, that's how one becomes a tech humanist i suppose yeah (laughs) and and this is very much focused on on the human side of technology and the integration between those two parts more so than what we read about so much so in the media is is technology is going to take over the world the robots are coming and stand back for the fact that we might not be in charge any longer. Yeah, it's funny because that's actually the the book I'm working on now that's going to be the next book. Uh, it's called A Future So Bright. And it bakes around my, um, my methodology around strategic optimism. And so I am a dyed-in-the-wool optimist. I believe that there are plenty of things that are challenges for us right now, like you say, robots, AI. You know, there's, there's definitely with the advancement of emerging technology, 
there's a lot of complications to that. And it, it changes the way we think about the future of work, which is different from the future of jobs, which is different from the future of the workplace, as we've learned explicitly through COVID. Um, and those things need to be well considered. But at the same time, we're also dealing with exponential climate change. We're dealing with geopolitical upheaval across all different kinds of spheres, you know, different places in the world, uh, different rises of different factions. And so there's a lot going on. And that's not even taking into consideration the pandemic and the economic fallout from the pandemic. So there's been a lot to deal with. Uh, and I think that, you know, taking it back to the tech humanist sphere, what I find when I think about, you know, the, the implications of data and emerging technology and how they change the future of humanity, for me, the opportunity seems like it, it's if we if we harness the idea that meaningful experiences are about that alignment between what a business is really, what it, what it exists to do and is trying to do at scale and what people on the other side of that experience are trying to achieve when they interact with that business, that that's the most obvious place to focus anyway. And so if we use, if we find that alignment and we make it as meaningful as possible and we use technology to amplify and accelerate that, that connection, then we're doing the things that benefit people on both sides of that transaction. And that's the, the right framing. That's the right sort of, you know, architecture to put in place for a better future. And I, I love that thought process of using technology to amplify meaning and, and, and to bring more purpose to it is we are largely talking right now to an audience full of people that are fully plugged into that philosophy is they use technology to amplify meaning in a very literal context right? <laughs> it is by the installation of, of hearing devices and, and, and amplification to give people back communication skills that perhaps they had once suffered from but just taking the healthcare industry is, is a bigger thing i know you've done a lot of work in healthcare and i also know that you utilize healthcare as a human being in this planet too what are you seeing almost as a, as a prediction, as a as a futurist about how humanity, healthcare and technology are all intertwined? And where do you see this all going based on your experience of looking at this landscape? It's a very complicated landscape. So I think we have a lot of really exciting opportunity um, with how AI and other emerging technologies can be used to you know, perform really advanced diagnostics and and create new relationships between uh, people and the people around them. And certainly like the hearing space seems like it's a, a great example of that. Um, there's a ton of opportunity there. I also think that we are facing, just as we're facing in every other industry, a challenge around what it means for the industry to have access to so much human data and how, mm -hmm. how do we make responsible use of that data. And, and you know, most of the companies, the leaders that I talk to at companies uh, understand the risk that comes with that too. You know, if you have a, a leak or a breach of the data that you've collected from customers, you're liable for that. And so there's a, there's a, a real cost to collecting that data. And there's obviously opportunity there because you can harness it and target it and, you know, do, you know, sort of um, effective marketing with it. And you can obviously create more meaningful experiences if you use it right. I think, it's just that we have the, those two things in tension with each other, and that's gonna be with us. That tension is gonna be with us as we move forward into the future. So mm -hmm. it requires these kind of healthy discussions about you know, what is it we're trying to do? How much data do we need to collect from people in order to serve them in the way that we need to serve them? And then what are we gonna do with that data? How are we gonna manage it? So this is a very data rich discussion. Yeah. But on the other side of it, like I said, there's just a ton of opportunity because of the uh, algorithmic, uh, you know, innovation that's happened and the, the AI space, the machine learning space, um, the robotics space. Uh, you mean you could go on and on the uh, um, autonomous vehicle space, drones, everything. It's just all there's so much happening that can move uh, human experience in such just profound ways. Um, but they they are, I think, very intimidating to people when they consider what that entails in terms of um, the tracking of human movement through space and the, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of the things that we do in, in relationship with one another, like the c communications that we have online or even offline, <laughs> if they're being recorded by, say, our smart speakers <laughs> in the room and things like that. Uh, and the um, the purchases that we make and the healthcare interactions that we have, like all of those things are generating this you know, enormous data 
I say data trail sometimes, but I also say data mesh other times because it seems like trail is too simplistic of an analogy. It makes it seem yeah. like it's just like dot, 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 dot. And you're done. Job. Yeah, but it's so much more uh, complicated than that. So that that I think is where what we're looking at is like how to make sure that we're uh, you know, making addressing both sides of that equation, like leaning into the innovation, making sure that we're you know creating new opportunities and new meaning experience, meaningful experiences with technology, while also looking at the responsibility of data and the ethics of data collection and use. Yeah, I, I agree completely, and we're going to dig you know further into some of this stuff later in our discussion today. But I think the here we are, early part, right? Q1 of, of, of 2021, we've just gone through a significant period of change. And, and my belief is in this moment, people are far more almost aware of this, um, this interaction between technology and humanity. There has become an increased level of awareness on it over the last 12 months, which I want to get into in more detail with you. But, but tell me from your lens, is, is what have you seen, what are you witnessing across multiple industries when it comes to the pandemic and then the relationship with humanity and technology and, and how that's perhaps changed the way that people think about technology given these times? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest shifts has been around the future of work and work, the workplace and jobs. So before the pandemic, a lot of the talks that I would give and the, the kind of um, panels I was invited to speak on had to do with the future of work. So much so that I, I had actually done a research piece and, and published a piece about a year ago, just, just a little over a year ago maybe, that was the future of work versus the future of jobs. And I really wanted to call out that distinction because I think it's really important that we look through the appropriate lens. When we talk about the future of work, we're really talking about it from a very employer centric lens. Like what are the roles going to be and how are we gonna manage remote teams and things like that? And when we talk about the future of jobs, it's really much more human concerns. Like how am I going to make a living? And what is my job going to be? Like how am I going to provide for my family? And you know, we talk about universal basic income as a possibility, but what is that really going to look like? How, who am I gonna be you know, kind of reporting into and collecting from? So those are very different sets of anxieties and considerations. And so I wanted to make sure we disambiguate those. But then through the pandemic, the future of the workplace became so much more obvious as, a, as another layer to this whole discussion that the, uh, the offices that people were working in were no longer part of the equation for the time being, that people were you know, removed from that and working from home remotely via Zoom, like so many mm -hmm. of these conversations. Um, and that it also forced a, a look at things like, you know, what is essential work? And, and many times the concept of essential work wasn't, you know, the knowledge workers. It wasn't the people who think we're thinking such big, important thoughts. It was the people who are doing the most grueling tasks, the hands on, on jobs that are, you know, boots on the ground and like cleaning surfaces and, you know, delivering food or, you know, staffing right. the, the uh, And restaurant. the majority of audiologists and hearing care practitioners that, that are connected to the work we're doing right now have, have been pedaled to the metal through through all of this and, and pivoting themselves around with every change in regulation that has been forced upon them and still doing it all with a smile on their face. 100%. Yeah. So that has been a very interesting revelation, I think, is to, to have the clarity of, you know, what what do we mean when we talk about essential work in a situation where uh, people are, you know, sort of removed from their normal conveniences and their normal routines, what needs to happen for people to go on and mm -hmm. do that what they do? And I think that that I, I think also sheds a little light on where we can use automation and where we can't. And so that makes it a little more interesting discussion uh, about, I think there's a huge opportunity for managing combined teams of humans and machines in workplaces and you know, leveraging the uh, efficiency of machines but the nuance and emotional intelligence and contextual decision making and judgment calls and things like that, that humans are better off making, because those are all yeah. very meaning heavy kinds of, of skills and machines so far are not very good at meaning. Thank goodness, because I don't think we want to delegate meaning just yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> and this is such an yeah. interesting context when you bring it towards the world of hearing care. Because my experience of working within hearing care for the last decade is actually it's been a very human centric conversation with a patient. Right? Largely what you're looking to be able to do is, is you're asking somebody to treat a problem that they don't want to admit to having with a solution they don't want to own. 
that when they own it, they are destined to try and make it not work because they want to prove that they are fine as they are. They don't want to pay for it. And if they do want to pay for it, they want to pay about a quarter of what they hoped for. And then it's going to work about half as well as they hoped it would. And at that point in time, they're going to choose to tell nobody, right? There, there is a giant emotional connection towards both the transaction, the journey at a patient level in the world of hearing. And what interestingly happens is the conversation is largely tech focused. The product is the star, the testing equipment is the star, the results of the audiogram is the star, the, um, you know, the results that come out of any holistic testing are gaining the hero of the journey. And the industry as a whole wants to hold on to the fact that it's mm -hmm. about the people, it's about the emotional thing, et cetera, wants to resist the tech side of thing other than the product. And there's a huge gap in the middle where technology could assist in brand building, in meaning, in creating meaningful relationships, in supporting the treatment plan over a period of time in creating diverse ways. Why do you think so many people want to resist utilizing technology to support a human centric mission. You know, it's it's funny because I think it's it goes the other way too. Like what you just described, you could flip that question yeah. around, uh, of course. And I think it's that we tend to compartmentalize and think, well, this is either going to be a human job or this is going to be a technology job. Uh, right. And and the truth is that nothing is exclusively one or the other anymore. I mean, most of us use an awful lot of technology in our day-to-day -day lives and probably wouldn't know how to function without it. So, yeah. you know, that that's a key part of that discussion. But I think, you know, you're so right thinking about, um, you know, that, that sense of, uh, first of all, the, the awareness of the meaningfulness and the, the sensitivity of the discussion and the, the diagnosis and the process that's happening with the hearing patients. I mean, after all, hearing is one of our core senses and senses are key to the way we make meaning, right? So that's, that is literally a big part of this discussion mm -hmm. and, and a really important one. So I think that, that cannot be underplayed and understated, that, that's a, that understanding that and really being clued in to the nuanced ways in which that literally plays into the meaning making process yeah. is, is key. And I'm so excited to talk to you about this stuff as well, because in many of the circles that we operate in with marketers and big brands and, and, and you know, the larger companies, their focus is always on the tech platform. It's about introducing AI. It's about uh, introducing automation. It's about looking at ways that what we can do is that we can streamline the workforce is, is they are tech focused discussions in the bigger companies. And then we work with small independents, like many of the people at Orange and Gray and much of the hearing care community that supports the US. And they're holding back saying, I don't want to get into tech. It's about the people. People need to come to the office. I want to get my hands on them this number of times. It's it's phone calls and in-person discussions and nothing else. And what I like about your work, Kate, is, that, is in your book, you talk about one of the most important things to do is to get clear on your purpose and to build a meaningful brand. Mm-hmm. And I didn't expect to be able to get that directly from from something that I you know, that you're originally thinking is is going to be a tech focused AI focused. Let's look at the future way. Is this desire to say how do we get clear on purpose and building a meaningful brand? So how do we apply that to an independent business that maybe has six employees, fifteen employees, thirty employees? How do we take from that and say, okay, can I get to my three, four, five, seven word statement? that signifies my meaningful brand? Yeah, I think that it, it's a valuable process for any size company, even solopreneurs. It's a, it's a valuable process to go through, to really try to distill and articulate in a crisp way what it is you exist to do as an entity, as a business, and what, and what you're trying to do at scale. I think mm -hmm. those two considerations are in, incredibly part of it, uh, incredibly important parts of that. I would also say that the thing I've noticed about digital transformation discussions in general, whether they happen in incredibly large companies or incredibly small companies, is that people's tendency is to start by talking about tech. And that's natural. That makes sense because you're talking about digital transformation. It sounds like it's going to be a tech discussion. Like you said, you're reading this book, you're thinking it's going to be a tech discussion. And it is. But I think what it, what, it, what I found is far more important is to start at that much more human orientation and just think about what problem you're solving for people and really deeply think about that uh, and, and how you can solve that problem in the way that makes the most sense 
and that is the most aligned between you and your customer or your client or your patient or whatever the language is yeah. in your in your case. Well, let's, uh, and let's notice get that they use closer the to that, Kate, and, and try and make that real. Try, let's try and make that real for a second because. You know, I have discussions with lots of hearing care clinics and, and their focus is often on how many units did we dispense or can we get through our appointments? Have we got enough staff to be able to deal with capacity? There are very few that have clearly defined a purpose or would have articulated the fact that they have a meaningful brand. I believe they have a meaningful brand, but have taken the time to be able to define that purpose or even articulate and document that purpose. How can you help somebody get to that? And also, why is it so important? And also, where have you seen examples in other industries where people do this well? Yeah, I think the reason that it's important, even for a, a small practice, is uh, to be able to hone in on what follows next. And what follows next are setting priorities and understanding the values that, that cascade throughout decision making in the organization. And then to be able to review things like annual and quarterly goals and be sure that those, you know, ladder up to the purpose you're talking about. And if they don't, it's almost like balancing a checkbook, right? Like mm -hmm. You're just trying to make sure that the things actually do speak to one another and that they do kind of add up in a sense. With Quite the, literally with, is this on purpose. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, and so I, I have seen in, in a couple of case, cases that had to do with healthcare, you know, I think it's, it's natural that the words may be similar from one practice to another um, because they're going to have something to do with care in many cases. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to do um, with, uh, uh, I don't know, like um, uh, helping in many cases. Yeah. So those, those words are innate to the space and it's understandable that, you know, one provider may not be all that different from another provider when they come up with their three, five, seven word articulation. That's okay. But I think it's still important that that, is the the sort of north star on helping focus where the priorities are going to be you know what the priorities are relative to your market and the customer base that you have but you don't necessarily if you if you don't have that that sort of truthful articulation and i say truthful because i think it really does need to be something that when you say it to yourself it kind of it kind of makes you sit back and go like, yeah, that's what I really should be doing, right? Yeah. I think about this with my own work. Um, when I remind myself that what I'm trying to do, and I, I use this in my um, Twitter bios and a few other places when I say like, I'm working toward helping humanity prepare for an increasingly tech-driven future. And when I just think about the words human prepare humanity. Like that's big, that's a huge scope. Yeah. And I understand that it's bigger than what I can probably ever really do. But I think that's where my work should be aligned. And I don't think that it's um, unrealistic. I don't think that it's um, that it's unfocused. And so similarly, I don't think that if anybody, if, if someone's hearing practice has to do with helping people live more fulfilled lives because they are more connected to their senses or you know something along those lines, I don't think that that's too big. I think that it, if that is what makes you feel like right. you're doing the work you really got into the work to do, then by all means, that should be your North Star. That should be your, your, guiding, your guiding drive. And that will help you understand the technologies that you need to bring into your operation. So once you understand better uh, how that clarity informs the priorities and the values and the attributes of the brand and the experiences that you build out, then you start thinking about, well, what could I automate around this process? Now that I understand how yeah. rich those experiences need to be with the people, the patients and the people outside the organization, which pieces of these could this could be automated so that it's more convenient for those people, so that it's less embarrassing for those people, so that it's whatever it is, because that's all part of making meaningful experiences. Yeah, I love it. And I'm trying to think about what this would look like in a hearing care clinic. And if I was owning a clinic today, I'd look at it and go, well, what was my purpose and what was my meaning? It would be helping the people of insert community understand and overcome the challenges related with hearing loss. And okay, that's more than your five to seven words. Sure, that's okay. The point that I plug into that is to both understand and overcome. And it's the community as a whole, not yes. just the people that are suffering with a difficulty. Yes. Now that changes what you might look at. It changes how you might use technology. It changes to say, well, actually, 
who is on the receiving end of these communications? Is it just the patient? Is it the patient and all of their family members? Is it me looking to be able to reach points of influence through the workplace? Am I looking to be able to educate children or just people over a certain point? And, and all of a sudden, the scope of work changes significantly. And therefore, the application of technology can truly change onwards from there, too. Yeah, I think an example that that seems re um, related to that, even though it isn't specifically hearing, is when I think about healthcare and I think about technology, one of the examples that always pops into mind for me is that hospitals so often forget to include really useful maps of the facilities in their websites and in their materials. Yeah. So people who are visiting people who are in hospitals are often at a loss for like, I don't, it's so daunting. I don't know where to right. park. I don't know how to enter the place. I don't know where to go to even ask for information. And I think that's, that's one of the most glaringly obvious oversights that could be fixed so easily. <laughs> and you're so right. We do it even with our clients and the websites that we plug into is we make sure that their address locations are easily findable by most GPS platforms. Yeah. So yeah. that when somebody is using GPS or SatNav to find somebody for the first time, then it directs them to where they are supposed to be, not to the front door of somewhere where they are hoping to be, or not to the McDonald's parking lot like 600 yards away. So you're so right. Is this belief of how do we use technology to support? It doesn't need to be this far out concept of you know, like a matrix like experience of it, it feeling like you're in a sci-fi movie. I think it can though. I mean, I think you can think about the, those emerging technologies. You can you can look at what's coming. You can stay attuned to the breaking news on on like uh, the new developments in the space and be thinking about does this serve my purposes? Like when you yeah. see information news about chatbots, you might think, you know, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if that would be a good tool to use in this place I've already defined. I've already thought about what the yeah. experience should be with this particular constituent uh, that's that's in the patient's community or whatever is the patient. So how might that be something that I would want to experiment with slash invest in and yeah. see if that does you know, facilitate this. And and again, what you're looking for is alignment. You're looking for that alignment between what it is that you are trying to do and what they're trying to do. And how can you make that simpler or easier, like, a, or more convenient or um, more delightful, yeah. <laughs> more memorable, something, you know, it should yeah. be some of those characteristics. I've seen lots of examples over the last few years of where people have embraced technology under the guise of looking to be able to improve customer experience. And the result has been tragic from my personal experience point of view. I'm guessing that you've witnessed examples that are like that, but also many on the other side too. Where are some examples that spring to mind in your head that we could perhaps learn from where people have embraced what might be seen as far out new technologies, et cetera, and the result has been an improved consumer experience through your lens? So I think a chatbot, since I was just talking about yeah. that technology, that's been one that I've seen play out some really interesting ways. So it can be horribly deployed. It can be one of the worst experiences because you can be feeling so frustrated that you're typing in what you think is a well-crafted inquiry about something or an ask for help. And then you get back what is obviously just a very dumb robot answer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, obviously, that's the worst case or, you know, a bad case scenario. You but see this I, with I, live chat versions that people have plugins in in this industry yes. sometimes where, you know, the AI hasn't been well programmed enough. It gets a very reasonable question provided with a, with a pretty dumb answer. Yes, yes. But what I have seen work very well, and I've seen it work well in healthcare, I've seen it work well in banking, I've seen it work well in utilities and a lot of different spaces, is to use that that um, initial chatbot inquiry in very specific ways. So you would use, you would have a set of questions, usually you're frequently asked questions that you've designed the uh, programming language, the, the language part of the program to be able to recognize those questions and mm -hmm. variations of them, and then answer them very succinctly so that people who are asking, you know, very sort of typical questions are getting very fast answers. But once they get, once they hit a question that there is no pre-programmed answer for, that that gives some kind of nuance like, hmm, let me see if I can get you a, an actual, like a human agent to deal with that. And it would transfer it over to a human agent. And so you know, as a, as a consumer, as a user, that you're interacting with something that's pre-programmed, 
but you also know that there is a, a seamlessness and a connection to human agents who are going to be able to solve your problem. And it's a very simple deployment. That's what most chatbot services that are plug into websites and services today can offer. Um, they weren't necessarily able to do that three, four years ago, but they're getting that they're they're almost all uniformly able to, to offer that now. I think that's the kind of thing that I'm seeing is just little by little, incrementally, we're moving our way toward, you know, these kind of standards for experience where yeah. it's understood that we're going to be able to do some things very efficiently and then the other things that we can't handle efficiently because they're edge cases we have to have a human in the loop we have to have a human who's reviewing the 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 edges of it and the nuance of it and giving emotionally intelligent answers yeah I, I even like though the, the fact that you said in those exa the example of chatbots there is the human element in the first instance that owned the fact that the chatbot was a chatbot. Yeah. Which, which exactly. I think is often where the biggest disconnect is, is when the consumer thinks they're speaking to a person and later finds out they're speaking to an AI in some way that they end up being disappointed. Whereas if they went into that conversation, knowing that they're speaking to a well-programmed AI, then that honesty and authenticity can start to carry on through and you can find it a useful service. And I'm, I'm thinking yeah. here and hearing care and trying to build off what you're saying for those that are listening. Mm -hmm. and, and what about questions like how much are hearing aids, right? We could definitely answer that with an AI, with some form of live chat, and we could provide a series of education that could ask some questions back and it could steer people through, you know, you know a, a question tree that is, is, is very, very helpful. A question tree that also, by the way, would give you a lot of insight as to this, this prospect, you know, it, the, with the nuances of the answers that you're asking them, you would be able to further filter what are the needs. And by the time you have a human who's responding to them, you've, you've preceded them with a ton of insight about right. this prospect. We're not going straight from lead to, I need to call this person to, I need to qualify. The, a lot of your qualification is happening using automation so that when you do intervene, you know what you're intervening with and your time is then better, better optimized. So I think, yeah, definitely the how much question, the what to expect question, the, um, you know, I need help for a family member question. These kind of things here would allow somebody to grow their education on the service that you can provide without you needing to get involved and allow you to scale yourself. And if we come back to that, that almost that purpose is to help the community be educated and overcome the hearing difficulties, leaning on the educate side of things, there's a huge amount that you can do to educate others as to why they would want to work with an independent hearing care clinic all using automation and AI, if you're prepared to be able to pour your humanity into it in the first place and and, yeah. and bottle your own brilliance. Love that. Yeah. So that means that we've got an element of both and think thinking, right? Is that is that what we're talking about? <laughs> it's a big feature of my thinking. It's so it's so central to my work. And I have a I have an explicit chapter on it in the upcoming mm -hmm. book. Okay. <laughs> it's so important. So, so what is both and thinking in Kate O'Neill's mind? So to me, uh, most things that we talk about are, are rarely black or white. There's usually, and it's, it's not that I can't land on an answer, it's that the truth for me feels like it usually has facets and that we need to have a, a nuanced conversation about that. So in the case of, of um, with Tech Humanist, with the work around that and with the way that businesses deploy technology to, to serve human, uh, human meaning, uh, the both and there, there are levels of both and there. Both and is is talking about the fact that um, you can be both profitable and create meaningful experiences, and that that mm -hmm. is actually yeah. one way to be incredibly effective as a business. Um, you create a lot of loyalty by doing that, which ultimately makes you even more profitable. Um, there's there's this sense that um, the technology itself that there's there's some both andness in, in that you have like the both both it is it can be intrusive to create some of these experiences and so we need to be very mindful of how we create them and the only way to make the most meaningful experiences that are um, that are going to be anticipatory and that are going to provide the most conveniences are going to be through the use of personal data and it's going to just be a very respectful use of that data so we have to straddle that line too and, and be very inclusive in our, our thinking of that I think for me, it's just there's there's rarely a topic on which I don't see um, 
that we need to acknowledge this one side of it, but also <laughs> we need to be talking about what's on, over here. And in the case of like the work around a future so bright and the strategic optimism piece, I feel like the important work is to be able to acknowledge the full landscape of what's possible in the world that yes, things could go very, very badly ar along this uh, along this axis. Um, but they also, the way they could go well is yeah. this way. And if we can see the way that they can go well, we need to work toward the way that they can go well while acknowledging that that bad possibility exists and not turning our eyes away from it because we need to keep our eye on that thing and not let it catch up on us. But we need to keep our eyes focused ahead on, on the opportunity that exists ahead of us. And I, I kind of wish that I had brought a little of that thinking into Tech Humanist because I think it's been, what I have found is especially through the pandemic, it's been an incredibly useful message for a lot of my clients to hear um, this sort of hybrid of thinking about Tech Humanist and how they can use, how the companies can use data and technology to create better human experiences and how to, they can amplify their businesses and so on. But also, hey, there's a lot of ambiguity we need to navigate. So can we talk about that too? And I think that's that's really relevant for anyone running any business right now. So Kate, in a second, I'm going to put you to work. And yeah. we're going to jam on some stuff together and see what okay. we can do to come up with some ideas that the independent business owners can implement using some of your um, your philosophies and, and also my knowledge and experience in the industry. So we're going to jam on that. Also, okay. Anybody listening here that's an Inner Circle member that is live and has questions that they want to ask of Kate, then while we're here in this recording, use the Q&A function, use the chat function. I'll field your questions. Make sure that Kate gives you that insight. And where I'm going to put you to work right now, Kate, is this idea of the fact that you have to iterate as you learn, mm -hmm. um, which is something you talk about extensively in the book. And this idea of integrating both online, offline, digital and physical, mm -hmm. those four things together if we are going to create a, a meaningful experience, if we're going to be able to build a meaningful brand, actually, it's a cocktail of those things. Yeah. So knowing that you've never run a hearing care clinic before, you've never been in the driving seat of saying, how do I create a meaningful experience? How do I build a purposeful brand in there? But I know I need to integrate these four things together. What would you be thinking from the outside looking in about how you might be going about integrating those four things together that could lead you to an, a, you know, a market leading, meaningful brand on purpose. No pressure. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the green super juice inside you right now, so I think we get the best out of you. My my matcha latte. You're going to get some great greatness out of me. Uh, no, I think you know what you articulated earlier. I think is a, is a really great starting point where you, you talked about the the very human realities of, of what patients go through, of the anxieties. Um, and uh, as someone who's married to someone who has uh, hearing aids and has gone through the hearing loss process, I've, I've witnessed it close up. So, you know, that, that sense of something's off and you live with it being off. And then eventually when you do get around to investigating it, it's like, well, I'm doing this only reluctantly and I don't really wanna know the answer. <laughs> like, you know, there's, there seems like there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in that. So I think that it would be my starting point is really trying to understand, and we would call it maybe the patient journey. This so yep. journey mapping is a very, uh, common practice with experience strategy. So understanding that journey and understanding what what the person on the other side of this experience goes through uh, at, at a very broad level from, from the very earliest recognition that there's an issue to the very successful satisfaction with their um, augmented hearing and with the, the um, and with the practice as well. Okay. So having laid that out, then I would start to be thinking about you know, where do, where does my practice and what is my expertise and the, the expertise I bring to what I'm doing, where do I really fit in that journey? Like what can I most affect and, and create the best possible experience? Because I'm assuming, and this may be wrong, but I'm assuming that most hearing care clinics are not serving that entire breadth of that journey, that they probably have different slices of it that they really excel at and might refer is this true or not true would you say that you might well, say well, like someone's at the earlier not. stage here's the crazy irony that exists in much of the industry is the patient thinks they're buying hearing aids off the back of being told they have a hearing loss at a hearing aid consultation mm -hmm. and they pay what in their mind is quite often a significant sum of money right. for devices 
and behind that get a package of quote unquote aftercare uh -huh, uh -huh. that is inclusive. The majority of patients believe that that aftercare is if it's break if it breaks you'll fix it if I need you you'll help me. Uh -huh. Yet in most sets of circumstances, it is a well crafted multi step appointment period uh -huh. over a period of quite often three four five years and in many cases is for the rest of ever. So there is this promise in the majority of private clinics that you come and see us and we recognize a challenge. We are going to ride with you for the rest of time okay. to help this be a less of a challenge. Yet that isn't necessarily the expectation of the patient, nor the okay. knowledge of the patient, even through the journey, even though the clinic thinks they're going to look after them forever. So we have a challenge and a disconnect in that. Yeah. So that is an interesting market challenge. Um, it's a huge opportunity for tech. Huge opportunity for tech. It truly is. So, all right. So you are living across the journey for the most part. It looks like your the early parts of that journey though are going to be served mostly by. Let me throw, let me throw you another problem as well. Yeah, go for In it. In the hearing care industry, on average, it's been proven that it takes somebody seven years to go from I think I've got a problem to I'm now going to consult with somebody to fix that problem. Seven years. Wow. So we have to be able to do something in this patient journey to shorten that seven year gap with some tools of thinking about online, offline, digital, physical, right? Yeah, I mean, so my my immediate thought is start, I'm starting to think about the content leadership and thought leadership that you create in the early part of the journey and the SEO work that you do to make sure that you're found on that stuff. But mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, I think a lot of that stuff is, is fairly nuts and bolts and you've probably explored a lot of that we stuff do a lot before. Of that. Yeah. Where I, I go next though, that, that really feels like it is more about the emerging technology is, wouldn't it be cool if you could use augmented reality uh, in an app feature or some kind of, um, web-based feature potentially that interacts with the phone it would probably be, need to be specific to the platform uh to to show people what different things sound like you can use you know augmented reality yeah. and audio and if there's you know ways that you could exhibit what different volumes sound like relative to one another or um, you know, you should be hearing this thing on the spectrum this frequency and if you're not hearing it you know that you can hear this other thing like yeah schedule an appointment with us today sort of thing. Um, but doing that in a way that is fun and and immersive and has like a discovery element to it. I, um, so I like that a lot. And some of that stuff is played out and the hearing aid manufacturers tend to be the people that fund that. So the bias on the creation of those tools is, look, with our product, look how much better this sounds. It isn't necessarily empathetically leaning in towards the human experience. It's making the product the star. And it should. I think that's why I think this is a really huge opportunity for the the hearing care side is is that you sort of you could own that whole empathetic space. Correct. And what I'm thinking of, if I listen to your idea right now of, of some way of implementing this is what if you could create a tool that would showcase how challenging it is for a friend or a family member to be able to live with a hearing loss. So that what you could do is you could spend more of your time in their shoes or even a snapshot of time in the shoes of the person in your life that you are currently shouting at or the right. you're getting sick of the fact that you keep getting asked to repeat yourself or you live in a house that has the t television volume on a, a ridiculous level. Like, like is if you could actually get a moment to say, let me experience what it's like to be hearing impaired then what you might have is a greater way of being able to influence that individual in an offline capacity to say, I get it now. We go in, I'm coming with you. I want to find out what, what can be done about this with you. And actually, the, you know, is look to influence that third party more so than yeah. the patient in denial themselves. This seems like a, a, a native fit for mixed reality in general, because that's what an awful lot of the success of virtual reality, for example, has been in empathy building kinds of, of exercises. Uh, I will say that um, I had a great guest on my show, the Tech Humanist show, who really specializes in empathy and tech. And she shown some light on um, where that falls short in some cases. Uh, so there there are some, some, uh, some gotchas around it as well and some guardrails around the use of it. We certainly wouldn't want to you know, make people feel bad about what they're encountering and we wouldn't want to make people feel like there was some sort of um 
you know, inspiration porn aspect to it in a oh, sense, true, true. right? Like, I think there's there's a way in which it could feel like, oh, we we this is you should feel sorry for the person, or uh, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, there's a lot I think of guardrails that you would want to build around how you create that experience. But with those things acknowledged, I think mixed reality could be a really natural fit for. Uh, both what you're describing, you know, having someone empathetically understand what it's like to be on the receiving end of, um, you know, someone not necessarily hearing everything that you say and and either seeming to ignore you or um, seeming to uh, like ask you uh, to repeat yourself a lot or whatever, um, or to seem like you, they just never heard what you said. <laughs> and right. That causes a lot of stress in a, in a marriage. Um, I don't know how I know that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, so there's that side of it. And then I think that what I'm what I was initially envisioning was more like almost like a game where you're uh, you're sort of moving through a, a landscape, a city space, a cityscape or something like that. And you're interacting with things you would normally interact with, like, you know, uh, pedestrian crossings and the auditory cues for those and traffic and um, sort of Doppler effect and things like that. And all of the kinds of things that I'm showing think, you New York right now, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it looks like, wherever you are. Um, pool splashing, I guess, is yeah. that <laughs> the Florida experience. Um, yeah. So I think you could, you could really play around with that, that sort of experience as and well. Even a simple piece post initial consultation, post accepting a treatment plan of gamifying the success that comes after somebody's taken treatment. And it could yes. be as simple as, you know, a straightforward test that they completed on day one where they got 17 out of 50 answers right, that they then, after their treatment, take a similar version of the same test and get 37 of those. And you automate the fact of where these timelines come and where they get those. So it doesn't have to be this creation of this huge VR world. We could actually yep. go lower tech Absolutely. But still look at ways of us being able to sprinkle success victories in progress of of the patient throughout. And you could do that no tech. Correct. You know, gamify the process just with, you know, outreach to the the customer or the patient and have them checking back and saying, Yep, you know, been using it for 60 days, you know, all's well, whatever. Like, okay, yeah. you just so cleared level two. Survey, simplified yeah. questionnaires. And, and, and I want more people to understand that, yes, we have this utopian vision of where tech could go, yet without having a you know, Fortune 500 budget to, to invest in that level of innovation, you can be like, I'd love that. How do I get there is harder. So, so still think that there are some, some smaller ways that you can be able to achieve this. And, and I'd encourage everybody to look at it and go, how do we take that principle and still find a way of applying it, even if I don't have a huge budget? Well, I think the thing that, that is exciting about that big picture dreaming though, is that many times in the, the consulting work I've done with smaller businesses, um, if there's an association or a consortium of some sort between the businesses, this is a great opportunity for collaborative development and collaborative innovation. If it would be something that would serve the entire space and would give more meaningful experiences and more meaningful insights to the business mm -hmm. back, then by all means, it seems like something that could be a, co a collaborative investment. So that's worth considering too. Hugely, hugely. I'm going to use your powerful brain even more so for the industry yes. here too. And there's been a, a challenge or an obstacle that has existed all the time that hearing devices have been in operation. And the, the, the stigma is that hearing devices are for old people. We also live in a world where almost every person with the means to be able to do so, when they find themselves with a problem, is happy to find an aid for it, whether it's spectacles, whether it's something that can brace my knee so I can still keep working out, whether it allows me to travel through an airport with more efficiency, whether it allows me to increase my productivity in the workplace. We are now a culture of people that love to find an aid or a hack or in some way uh, a tool that can amplify our performance. Yet still in hearing care, the stigma attaches to the for old people, even though there are lots of people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s that are suffering from a hearing difficulty that could be remarkably helped with the right treatment plan and the right amplification. Yeah. How does an industry like hearing care approach that issue or how would you approach that issue if you were challenged with that obstacle to say, how do we try to normalize the treatment of hearing loss outside of the elderly? I think 
you know, what, what I've seen happen in uh, this and related spaces is that the, where tech comes into play, is that the sort of hackish approach to certain kinds of devices and technologies tends to make it a little sexier and more interesting, yeah. right? I've seen an awful lot of people use um, AirPods in a way that was assistive. Yeah. And I'm sure that, you know, folks on this call have seen that as well. Yeah, um, that's the it by Oh, I bet, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I was scared for a lot of reasons. I would think like, uh, you know, from a business standpoint, sure. But well, I think even out of just concern and consideration for the patient, like you don't know what you're doing as a person who's setting your own volume levels. And yeah, so I, I can totally understand that. But I have yet, I, yet I see that all the time in, in sort of roundups about like, here's 10 things you didn't know how to do with your iPhone. Like, oh yeah, okay, let's use our AirPods as a, a hearing assistive device. Um, but then again, so, you know, Clubhouse, this new, um, newish social platform yeah. that's, uh, audio only, I don't know how many uh, of you on the call have been dropping into it or have uh, signed up for it. If you have an iPhone or an iOS device, you can sign up for it now. They're, they're not open to anything beyond iOS now, but uh, since it's an audio only platform, that's created some interesting, uh, logistical challenges for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. And one example that I heard recently um, of how someone got around this in, in the actual clubhouse town hall that they do every Sunday afternoon, the founder was saying that, that they learned about a young woman who was uh, connecting a Google Meet instance, so the, the, the sort of like Zoom Google Meet app, to clubhouse. She was bringing clubhouse audio in through Google Meet, and then Google Meet has a uh, real-time transcription service, so it can go audio to text. And then she was able to, um, I'm not sure if she was actually um, producing her own text back or if she was using a text-to-speech uh, or speech-to-text simulator kind of yeah. thing. Uh, but one way or the other, very cool hack. But I think it just shows that there's there's an appetite for you know showing what how you push the limits of technology, but also of the, of human limitations of what yeah. we, what we perceive as human limitations. And so I think there could be some really interesting marketing opportunities, some content thought leadership opportunities by looking at ways that um, not necessarily that, that skew toward people solving their own problems in ways that are going to create more problems or that circumvent business, but that show how much a part of our lives hearing is and hearing losses are and that those of us who are, you know, looking for ways to get around it and deal with um, who are looking for these little hacks, you know, we probably ought to be thinking about it in a more holistic way. I mean, we ought to be. Yeah. I mean, you've just given me a, an awesome content idea for the majority of our inner circle members where what we have is almost every premium level hearing device right now will stream direct from from an iPhone. You know the power of podcast culture and clubhouse, et cetera, is if we can showcase content of how people are using their hearing devices to discreetly listen to content that they want to be able to consume yeah. in a way that makes them cool and smarter and more agile to other people. That's just another drop in the bucket towards the fact that these aren't you know, an incapacitator. They're actually an enabler yeah. that, that, that gives some form of superpower. I think it's also, you know, there there are human stories that help humanize these kinds of issues. And there's a real opportunity and this this steers away from tech and more into sort of straight up marketing and branding, but but I think that the opportunity exists to try to tell some very human stories about just normal um everyday circumstances that over time can lead to the yeah. hearing loss that everyone sort of starts to, to have, or most people start to have. My husband made his own uh, situation, his own diagnosis more palatable to himself because he used to be a rock musician. So, you know, he, he was found a, his justification that is found his the well used. That was, yes. He was like, well, I was a rock star. So this oh, is just the course. consequence of that. It's one of those things. With but it. I think no, there Robbie, probably are good. those kinds of, <laughs> yeah, like there probably are those kinds of stories that we can, you know, with a, with humor, but with empathy, tell about how people lose their hearing and how people come to the situation where they need a little help, 
but it's because they've lived full lives or it's because yeah. they've done, you know, that sort they of thing. They own it with a level yeah. of like up as opposed to like, oh, wow, I'm on the downward street. Path. Yeah, exactly. And I okay. want to keep living a very full life. I want to have all of that in, uh, in front of me. Yeah, we, we work on that a lot, but hearing that from your point of view certainly adds to it. Let me pose you another challenge that this industry faces is it's done a good job of leading with technology from a marketing point of view for some time, largely focusing on the widget, right? The tech that exists within the hearing device itself, the power of the chip, the processing power, the ability to learn in this, the manufacturers do a wonderful job of making up new terms like binaural directionality 17. Right. <laughs> you know, all these things that start to be able to confuse people into thinking that high tech is even more high tech. Um, the downside of which is now that the consumer base thinks that the tech is the star. Yet one thing that I've learned from working in this industry for so long is that the tech without a skilled technician and somebody to help somebody travel the long term emotional journey of treating hearing loss results in in amplification, but not solution. Yeah. Add to this now that what we're facing is an onslaught of well-funded direct-to-consumer online retailers in the hearing care space that are data-driven in terms of the way that they are market, that have ridiculously deep pockets when it comes to being able to, you know, to find more of the right kind of patient and sell a version of we're the same as the majority of people listening to this call but cheaper and direct and you don't need to sit in the chair and you don't need to see a provider and you don't and you don't. Differentiator in price of circa 6,000 to circa 2,500. So a significant difference in, in price, but you've got that. And we've now got the, uh, the deregulation of certain hearing devices in the over the counter hearing devices are going to be available with talk like brands like Bose and Apple and these mainstream brands getting in on the, on the act with the belief that these devices are going to be available over the counter for 500, 600, 700. How do you as somebody who cares massively about the human side of the treatment of people with hearing difficulties deal with what's happening over here and turn that adversary into an ally how do you how do you utilize your philosophy around that to say okay i know what's coming but i can control what i can control yeah i mean i think it sounds like there needs to be a part of the practice that's about accepting these consumer devices in and and offering that like you said the lifetime of care that's the aftercare appointments for these consumer purchased devices I, that that feels like it's an inevitable and a no-brainer but i i don't know if there's some reason why that would not be possible or would not be um, palatable to to the folks in your audience uh and I'm, i'd welcome any of you who are in the audience to to chime in with in the chat and and say you know what you see as the obstacles there but um you know, certainly it's not, uh, there's not as high a revenue opportunity, but it seems like there's just as long of a life cycle and uh, there's just as much of a sense of helping people genuinely recover their hearing and, yep. you know, use the tools at their disposal to do so. Um, so, so I would see that as it's a huge boon if you can embrace it, right? Because it's opening up an incredible market opportunity. It's going to, it's going to increase the market share tremendously. And as long as you're positioned to be able to intake, you know, some of that post-consumer market, it seems like a tremendous opportunity. Yeah, I agree with you. It definitely feels to me like it starts to broaden the scope of horizon to the size of the market that will accept treatment. Mm -hmm. The key is differentiation right. of, of explaining why you're Ruth, Chris, and not Burger King. Yeah. Right. From 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 that point of view and explaining the difference between you, you know, cutting your own toenails and going for a high level pedicure. Right. It, 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 it's <laughs> that kind of level of differentiation. Oh, you just made me want a pedicure. <laughs> <laughs> one day, Good one day. day. <laughs> hey, in your book, you also talk about the importance of having one eye on the now and one eye on the future. And my belief is that lots of people think that the future is, is scary. Yeah, what they're thinking about is the future that is scary is actually the now. <laughs> like, actually, yeah. what they're fearful of is what we're actually living in. Right. Um, so, so fast forward 10 years in your mind, knowing that you are, you are very close to the line um, of, of following trends, of seeing where the future's going. What, what do you think our world is going to look like? 
five, 10, 15 years on from now using your experience? Well, I think the the thing that's been clear to me over the last 10, 20 years is that the future looks like a, um, I haven't yet come up with a good term for this, so maybe you can help me, but something that that's like the closer it is into you, the crisper it is, and the the fewer of the, uh, the options for it to deviate from where it is now. And the farther out it gets, the wider that that range gets. And what I think about 10 years from now is that that's an enormous question because you are looking at an awful lot of things that have um, five-year impact to 10-year impact. Climate change alone is uh, something that within 10 years could make a uh, a marked difference in in the way that we experience the world. Uh, we're already seeing you know severe climate events happening on a regular basis. So I think that's a that's a really important thing to recognize is that any futurist, anyone making predictions who says like, well, ten years from now we're going to all be doing this or it's all going to be like this, is BSing you because there's absolutely no way to know that in the context of how much variability there is. But I think. What, what is more important and more interesting to me is that there's an opportunity to move us in a very interesting direction in 10 years, that within that range of what's possible, that we have the opportunity to, um, to put technology in place that really addresses human concerns at scale. So uh, I've been collecting headlines for a while now that anytime I see any kind of AI experiment or proof of concept, that rolls out where someone is trying to address uh, like water shortages or um, cleaning up ocean plastics or solving um, food distribution problems in like India or places like that. Um, I collect those headlines and I've been, I have a slide where I've laid them all in and color coded them to match the, uh, the, each of the sustainable development goals on the, the diagram of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are 17 goals, if you're not familiar, 17 goals that the UN developed um, to accomplish by the year 2030 that will measurably improve life on earth for every human being. And not just every human being, every living thing on this planet. So there are things like life below water and life above water. There are things like gender equality. There are things like you know no poverty, education, all kinds of things. And so what I think is that AI and plenty of other emerging technologies, but this slide that I'm talking about specifically has been a collection of AI headlines alone. We could do everything if we're using the resources and tools at our disposal to solve those problems. And I mean, within a five to 10 year time frame, we could solve all of them. Uh, and that is, that's an incredible responsibility. Like the, the fact that that exists, the fact that we could means absolutely that we should. And there's there's really no ethical argument for why we shouldn't be doing that. The thing, the only thing that holds us back is that business incentives don't always align. And so what I think the, the biggest obligation that we have is to find every possible way to align business incentives with human outcomes. And that goes all the way back to thinking about hearing care clinics, thinking about how your own business incentives how you make money, how you continue to make money, how you thrive as a business and how you employ others to thrive, how that aligns with the best outcomes of the people who come and entrust their, their hearing to you. I think this goes across everybody who's in business. We all need to be thinking about how to align what we are doing professionally with what happens to the people that we serve. So that's, what I, that's what I see. Uh, 10 years, it, it could be anything, but I want it to be the best possible outcomes. I want it to be the best futures for the most people. It's going to be, it's going to require every one of us thinking that way. Uh, and not all of us are going to be able to use AI. Not all of us are going to be able to use robotic process automation. But those of us that are are moving the needle, you know, a little more in that direction are going to support those who are going to use the, the more uh, scaled, uh, hugely at scale technologies. And, and I think the more we move things in that direction, the more we sort of set the precedent and the expectation that that is how business is done, that the better chance we have of living in a 2030, 2031, <laughs> where we have solved an awful lot of human problems uh, and, and we have created an opportunity where 
the world will be better off in 2040 and 2050 as a result of the decisions we're making over the next few years. Wow. See, that is one of what you expect when you ask the question of somebody who many might describe as a futurist to describe the future is just to push the onus and the responsibility back on us individuals. <laughs> How do we go about approaching this? Okay, I want to try and try and wrap this up because we've talked about a lot and a lot of it's been very high level. I'm sure it's been remarkably thought provoking for everybody listening. How do we turn this into maybe a set of action steps, a set of takeaways from people listening to our conversation today? You know, what should be some of the things that they should definitely look to do? Because one of them that jumps top of my mind is this put some thought into into your purpose, into creating that purpose statement. So you have the the you know, the clarity of your decision making uh, of being to say, is it aligned to this? Yeah. And, and then get the unison of the, every stakeholder in your in your organization. So employees, patients, family members, community leaders, et cetera, are aware that's what you're set out to do. That sounds like one big mm -hmm. takeaway that even if that alone was, was realized or even nudged closer towards would be a big step. What else would you add to that in, in actions or takeaways that independent business owners in the hearing care space can take from this and say, here's stuff I should do? I'll give you one sort of tech humanist takeaway and one yeah. a future so bright takeaway. Okay. <laughs> and the, the tech humanist takeaway is, you know, I think we all have to measure and manage our businesses. We all have to have the metrics that tell us, you know, whether we're making the right investments and managing our resources effectively. Um, so we need those business focused metrics, but I would challenge you to think about whether you need to introduce at least one customer focused metric. What can you be measuring on a daily, weekly, monthly, whatever kind of cycle that tells you about how your patients are doing, that tells you about how the humans are faring on the other side of the equation. Uh, you may already have that in your business. And if you do, you're ahead of the game. So congratulations. But if you don't, if you don't already include in your dashboard of meaningful metrics to run your business, something that specifically talks about how successful the person on the other side is at what they're trying to accomplish, then it's an opportunity. And that's going to give you an awful lot of clarity about how the business metrics that you are managing and that metric outside the organization can better align. And the more, the more closely you look at that over time, the more you're going to see opportunities to make that make sense. So that's one. That's the tech humanist takeaway. Yeah. The uh, strategic optimism slash a future so bright takeaway is, you know, a lot of times we focus on what could go wrong when we roll out a new project. We think a lot about, you know, if we're, if we're launching something new or trying something new, we spend a lot of time thinking about like, uh, what what could what mistakes we could make and how to prevent those and how to manage the risks and we absolutely should do that. There's nothing wrong and it's very sensible strategic work to do. What we don't often do enough of is think about what could go right in a strategic way as well. So, for example, startups, uh, software startups and tech startups, notoriously don't think about what could happen if their software is wildly successful. And so you end up with launches where the server crashes. Uh, and so you've just killed the momentum. You brought in a whole bunch of people who were all enthusiastic to try your new tool, or your new platform, and they had the worst possible first experience that they could. What would have solved that is if you'd thought, what if this succeeds beyond our wildest dreams? Should we make sure that we have you know, extra server capacity, that we turn the throughput all the way up on our serving server hosting, you know, whatever it takes. And so as that applies in your businesses, whether you're thinking about rolling out a new marketing plan, whether you're thinking about, you know, putting those uh, uh, aftercare procedures in that are sort of aligned with that post-consumer marketplace, whatever it is, I would challenge you to think about whatever you're rolling out, whatever you're introducing that's new and exciting and, and a little scary, what if this goes really, really well? And make sure that you're planning for that side of it too, because that there's an awful lot of, of great momentum that can stop in its tracks if you don't allow for the possibility of expansion and success. So good, so good. Thank you. I'm gonna add one more. Great. Just from my side, which is, is just give further consideration to where automation can provide increased levels of education to the entire stakeholder community that you're looking to serve. 
And, and if you view automation just in that lane of education, all we'll be doing in hearing care is catching up with dozens of other industries that have been doing this for a serious period of time. So you're just looking to be able to, to follow the clues that have been laid down in the square. But automation doesn't need to be scary. It can just be a way of, of you well documenting and, and, and well providing the answers to the questions that the people that you care about are looking to find and would love to find them from you if you made them available. Yeah. That's good hey, stuff. O'Neill, you are a rock star. I look forward to the days that we get to be able to hang out again in person. I miss you dearly. Yes. Thank you so, so much for carving out some of your time with not only our Inner Circle members, but the hearing care community as a whole through the podcast. How can people find out more about you? What's the deal with this new book? When can we expect <laughs> to be able to see it? Um, and, and how can people continue the conversation with you should they choose to? Yeah, so you can find me and my company at koinsights.com. Uh, and that is my uh, consulting advisory speaking business. Uh, so that is online, koinsights.com. You can also find me on all the social media platforms, Kate O on Twitter and so on. Uh, the book, A Future So Bright, should be uh, available in about Q3. Uh, the, the date is still squidgy. Yeah. We're still working on that. Um, but yeah, so sometime around Q3, uh, sign up. If you go to koinsights.com and you join the mailing list, you will get the alerts when it is available for pre-order and all that sort of thing. I think all of us could do with a slice of the future is so bright right now. So I'm very much looking forward to being able to receive that. Kate O'Neill, thank you once again so much. Thank you, everybody who was listening in live. I'm seeing some comments come through the chat. Lots of thank yous, lots of incredibles, even a mic drop, which is nice, right? We remember what that felt like once upon a time in the day when you were in a real room. Uh, but yeah, so good. Amazing. Thank you so much. So Kate, the live audience here are very appreciative of your insights. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Now. And there we have it. That is a wrap. Thank you so much for listening to the Business of Hearing podcast. Make sure you subscribe to be the first to know when a new episode goes live. If you're feeling kind enough to share your experience and leave us a five-star review, it would mean the world to us. And if you want to learn more, then go to www.orange-gray.com for article guides and training specifically written for high-performing hearing care businesses. We look forward to speaking to you again soon.